I was going to introduce our keynote speaker. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's no. Uh, so, please, just, please, just go. Just please go. welcome. <laughs> If that had all gone well, that was going to be the coolest 40 seconds of my life. I don't think anyone has ever offered to play me rock music as I take the stage to talk about programming. So that's pretty again. great. Pre what's that? Oh, no, no. I, th I think we'll just keep going. Um, so, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Angelina Fabro, and I work for the developer wrench team at a company called Mozzarella. You may be familiar with our browser called Mozzarella Foxfire. Although sometimes it's called Firefox by noobs who don't know any better. You might also know of us from Voxfire OS, the first mobile phone to target exclusively the Red Panda population. Despite dwindling numbers and endangered status with the World Wildlife Federation, Red Pandas use social media 210% more than all other mammals, including humans. It made the most sense for us to target Red Pandas first. Now, uh, back in 2013, I gave a talk at JSConf uh, US 2013, and it was a talk about how to be a better programmer. And uh, Peter saw that talk, and actually he really liked it, and so he invited me here to do uh, a keynote. And he said he wanted something like that talk. He wanted something aspirational in nature, something that really you know, gets at the truth of a matter. Around the same time, I published a article on a website called The Pastry Box, and I talked about something called imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome. And basically, the gist of that is that uh, I called for anybody who writes code for any reason, whether a professional or a hobby, not to discount their practice for any reason. Basically, if you write code, you're a developer. That was the message I wanted everybody to have in their heart. Um, okay, so that's what I thought at the time. The thing is, turns out that I was wrong, so terribly wrong. And I'm really sorry about that, actually. I'm here to apologize and admit that I was wrong. Uh, there are imposters in our field, it turns out. Some of them are probably right here in this very room. The imposters in our industry go by many names, the most common one being designers. And sometimes, in an attempt to impart their relevance, they'll call themselves designer developers, design engineers, dev designers. Now, obviously, the sole purpose of writing software is to trick some VC into giving you money so that you can make something that's kind of OK and then get bought by a larger company who, for some reason or another, feel mildly threatened by your tiny but present market position, netting everyone who did very little a lot of profit. So on your quest to acquire large sacks with dollar signs on them, you need to be careful who you hire and who you work with. You don't want to waste any time or money on people who aren't breaking their backs with hardcore programming skills to make you, the boss they should be grateful for, as much money and credibility as possible. I mean, how else are you going to sell your company for even more cash? So I decided that I need to repent for spreading such egregious misinformation. I mean, it, it is obviously the least I can do. So I figured out some easy ways to identify imposters in our field so that you don't waste time on these codeless cretins. And although designers are the most dangerous culprits to watch out for, I've also spotted some other imposters that we'll discuss along the way as the need arises. So your first clue that you're dealing with an imposter and that you're dealing with a designer is that they make things look good. So if you uh, happen to encounter someone who's using any of these terms, uh, typography, grid system, layout, emotions, poetry reading, crayons, consistency, well, you can be certain that you're dealing with a designer at best or an art director at worst. What we know from marketing psychology, though, is that things don't need to look good in order for users to click on them and participate in the web, web, pardon me, the web economy. These two websites, for example, well, they convert users really well. You can harvest a lot of emails with high contrast, simple websites. So take a look at this website, for example, from subtle.com. Uh, sure, some people might say it looks good, but they're almost certainly designers, too. White space? More like wasted space. See, look, look at what we can accomplish when we use that space properly. <laughs> okay, so the next clue that you know you're dealing with an utter fraud is that they know CSS. 
Obviously, if you encounter someone who knows CSS, also known as California Style Sheets, they're a designer <laughs> and not a developer. In fact, industry expert Dr. Jen Schiffer published a whole article on how to deprecate your CSS so that we have one less language in our stack to worry about. CSS is mainly, look, pardon me, CSS is mainly used to make things look good on the web, which as we've, as we've already established is unnecessary and the hallmark of someone who is not a real developer because CSS is not a real programming language. Another clue is that they don't know CSS. Because I'm going to be frank with you, if you're using a framework or a toolkit that provides style for you, but you don't understand the underlying CSS, you can't be a real developer. So that's right. You shouldn't know CSS too well. Then you're in danger of becoming a real designer, and, and you're not a real developer anymore. They're basically a, a binary thing. Uh, still, CSS is everywhere, and you need to know how to deal with it and deprecate it, as Dr. Jen Schiffer has recommended. Now, your next clue, whew, man, and this one gets under my skin, they care about user experience. So there's these other imposters in the world of design that go by the names of user experience designer or interaction designer or other fluffy terms like that. And basically, these people are like designers, but worse. So these jerks, no, get this, these jerks pretend to know how software should behave so that users aren't frustrated. Mostly they just end up being annoying as I talk about things like use cases or user testing or that last one, design patterns. And you know as soon as you hear the term design patterns come up that you're dealing with another fraud. So remember, by telling you how your software should behave, they're telling you exactly how you should write your code. It's safe to ignore their arrogant suggestions because nobody knows how to code better than you do. If your boss tells you to listen to them, only implement parts of what they explain to you. Make it abundantly clear that you control the domain of programming at the company, and you're only going to take their advice when you feel like it. Your users aren't going to notice a difference. We've already established you don't need great design to acquire users and clicks. The next one, and this is a big one, is that they know jQuery. So sometimes designers will figure out how to download code off the internet and even put it into their websites. <laughs> jQuery is a programming language that is even more popular than JavaScript because it was, made, <laughs> it was made so that designers can pretend that they know how to code. It's really easy. You just got to put the jQuery code in your page and copy and paste some lines verbatim from the jQuery website and everyone will think you know how to code. Most of the time, these jQuery plugins don't add anything useful to websites. They're just used to make designers feel good. Take this uh, little date picker here, for example. Now, those user experience folks I talked about earlier might tell you that this is more intuitive for users, but we know that we don't actually want things to be simple. I mean, just think fumbling around, they might actually click on an ad and make you some money. But even if we don't have ads, we can just use an HTML input field and let a real developer handle the input. Another important point. They don't know jQuery. Of course, if you don't know jQuery, you're also not a real developer. Much like California style sheets, jQuery should be ripped out and deprecated because true developers work exclusively in the land of the purest of the pure. In order to build programs, you need to see through every abstraction and be able to work comfortably at the lowest possible layer. And this means that if you're building JavaScript applications, you simply must be comfortable building them with nothing but ECMAScript. That's right, you shouldn't be programming with JavaScript, but with the script language standard it's based on. By now it should be clear that anything that has to do with front-end development is barely relevant to actual programming. The real developers all work server-side, probably in PHP and sometimes in Node's JavaScript. If you're worried about Node.js going out of fashion, consider learning a language that has already made a name for itself and stuck around through its legacy and technical debt. Consider learning PHP. Now, PHP stands for Pretty Hardcore Programming. <laughs> so you don't ever have to question its legitimacy and industry staying power. Now, I was talking about those other kinds of frauds. All right, so you got to ask yourself if these, these, these people you're encountering work with people, servers, or art. Because if you work with a server in any capacity, you're DevOps and you shouldn't be taken seriously as a developer. I know, I know, you're gonna tell me someone needs to write the nodes JS, but if you do with you anything else on a server, you can't be a real developer. Sure, we can say that a real developer wrote the Linuxes once upon a time, but since operating systems have been basically solved forever, it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, setting up a server and backing up stuff sometimes, that's not a real job, and it definitely does not make you a real developer. 
If you work with people, you're either a manager or a community interaction specialist of some kind. <laughs> Either way, it's obvious that you're not a real developer. And you might have learned to code as a hobby or to try and get real developers to listen to what you're selling. And maybe some of them will be dumb enough to do that. However, the rest of us are on to you. Now, managers are basically babysitters. <laughs> managers are basically babysitters to make sure that the company only hires real developers and that they're meeting their minimum quota of lines of code per week in order to earn their salary. Similarly, developer relations types and community managers are just glorified feel-good nannies for the users of your product, whether they be end users or end developers, the latter, of course, being relevant if you are shipping code for other real developers as well. So if you work with art assets, <laughs> well, if you work with art assets, you should probably just leave right now. There is no help for you. Um, the nearest exit is located over there at the back. So another important one, of course, is that you know you're not dealing with a real developer if they don't know exactly what you know. I'm going to draw a line in the sand. Let's say this, this Venn diagram here. If I know a thing, it's a thing that you need to know in order to be a real developer. It's time for some audience participation. Put up your hand if you know what a bee tree is. OK, OK, OK. Now, uh, who knows what a bloom filter is? Hands up. Okay, those of you that put your hands down after the first one, you're no longer real developers. <laughs> now, on the other hand, if I don't know a thing that's about some kind of programming that I don't need to care about, then this rule doesn't really apply, whatever hand with. Uh, hey, you might say, do you know how Java handles thread pooling, you might ask? Well, of course not. I'm a Node.js developer. All of my eventing is handled in an event loop like God intended. <laughs> So if someone says they are a developer and they are using the right programming languages like you, but they don't know all the things that you know, chances are they are a sham too. It may be difficult for you to admit that a lot of your friends and coworkers are frauds. They may not be beyond hope though. All you need to do is explain to them that they need to have the same opinions and knowledge as you. So be willing to talk to them, or rather at them at length, about these things without interruption or break. Who wouldn't love that, right? You're doing them a favor. Make sure you don't let them interject with any questions. Those would just get in the way of all the learning that needs to happen. <laughs> so another, another, another key uh, to know that you're not dealing with um, not a real developer is that they're not a 24-year-old white guy. <laughs> sometimes people who are not white and people who are not men, and sometimes both will whine about this, but since there's so few of them, you don't really need to pay attention. There is absolutely no reason to believe that, that this industry is hostile to people other than 20-year-old white guys. I mean, who are they kidding? The door is open. All you have to do is work hard. It's basically a complete meritocracy. Now, if a woman ever criticizes our industry for this, this is called misandry, which is a very serious and growing problem. I mean, it, it might even be systemic one day, although it's not now. But you should be really, really careful. And uh, whenever a woman describes inequality, tries to address it with people, make sure to interrupt her so that she knows exactly that it's not all men that are the way she's described, and also that as a man, since the industry is filled with men, you must know best for the entire industry, all races and genders included, so you can safely tell them to be quiet while you explain to them how their experience actually is. So you might be wondering why someone who looks like a woman is giving this talk. Well, you see, for a long time, I convinced myself that I was a real developer, you know? I did serious full-time developer work. I was writing real code with the real languages, the right languages. But now that I'm in a role that is something like developer relations, which is basically, we you know, 100% marketing all of the time, everyone knows that I must not write any code. In fact, after most technical talks where I actually show people how to code, Someone almost always needs to tell me that I'm an imposter. Yes, that's right. Someone will ask me if I write any code or assert to me that I must not write any code and how right they are. Thank you for reminding me. So and another important thing, resumes, they're obsolete now. Do you uh, know one thing that separates real developers from fake ones? Well, real developers have dozens and dozens of projects at any given time in their GitHub account. <clears throat> You should be asking yourself some deep questions if you're ever out having beers with your coworkers. In order to accomplish having lots and lots of profile or lots and lots of uh, repositories in your GitHub profile, you have to give up a lot of your free time. So if you are hiking or having beers with your friends, you should be asking yourself, could I be coding right now? 
Am I a real developer? Could I drink beer while I code? Can I possibly consume more caffeine today? Why don't I care more about what everybody on the internet thinks of me? <laughs> also, you might have to slack off at work a little bit because there's nothing that kills a coding buzz like having to do work on copyrighted code in a private repository during normal work hours. Real, de real developers never work on proprietary code and they're 110% open source heroes always and forever and make that software free too. You might have other obligations like a family and kids, but nobody cares about that in the industry, right? Because you're supposed to be a 24-year-old white guy after all, willing to work long hours for the good of the company, and if you can't do that, you might as well give up now. So here's a game you could be playing. Count all of your active GitHub repositories, then include the number of open source repositories that you forked. Finally, multiply this by the number of favorites that you have, and this is a measure of your value as a person and your worth as a real developer. If your profile on GitHub is scant of influential open source contributions, nobody is going to take you seriously. Now, remember, proprietary code is as good, and good as invisible and does not count. If you're hiring for a developer, you'll be able to tell if they're serious by looking at their GitHub track record. Throw out their resume. Resumes are obsolete now and won't tell you anything you need to know about a candidate's experience. And this next one, this next one is really important. Never be wrong, ever. There is nothing in the world more poisonous to your represent, re, pardon me, is rep, nothing in the world more poisonous to your representation, your reputation as a real developer than admitting that you don't know something, or worse, admitting that you might have been wrong at some point. You cannot be a code rock star, a ninja, or an expert of any kind in this industry if you ever admit to being wrong. You have to be so perfect that you attain a kind of programmer godhood. Often, you can measure this by the number of Twitter followers you have, or sometimes your clout score. So as you begin to have serious arguments with other developers out there on the internet, you will have a number of people willing to back you up at all costs, thus reinforcing that you are never wrong. Because if a lot of people on the internet say that you're right, then you can sleep well in the evening knowing that you're right in the most absolute of terms. Now, Now, I mean, my suggestion for you here is actually that if you think you're right about something, it doesn't matter how inconsequential it is. Really just dig in your heels so that the other person just eventually gives up. It doesn't matter if it actually means anything. What only matters is that you're right. So, okay, so maybe we've come this far into this talk and you're still unsure. Imagine you've done everything you can to become a real developer and you still don't feel like one. And that's because you're an imposter. All of your coworkers are real developers, but well, you're, maybe you're just a moron. Everybody talks about you behind your back and they know you're not a real developer. You probably have no idea what you're doing and the worst possible thing would be for someone around you to discover that you've been an imposter this entire time. So you better keep faking and suffering quietly. Remember everybody, the whole reason we're here is to keep other people out. Software development is serious and exclusive, and if we start letting suits and designers and anybody else pretend to be developers, it's just going to get worse for all of us. So stay on the watch, and remember, if you see someone who's not a real developer, a real developer uh, report it to the nearest authority, they'll know what to do. Thank you, Scotland JS. <laughs> seen that image at the very beginning that was literally like a mozzarella Firefox on a pizza and someone made that for me in Photoshop. Well, I had a couple people that I, I tweeted, I tweeted like a couple days ago, like, hey, I have a weird request. Um, I need someone with some Photoshop help. It has to do with pizza, which got, of course, some curious replies, but like, what the hell is Angelina talking about? And I talked to two different people. Um, one of them made the one that was in the presentation, but another person, I think, misunderstood me and then went and actually made a mozzarella like Foxfire Pizza, which I'll show you the images of in a moment here, and sent me like an entire SkyDrive account of like the entire process of making the pizza. His name is Christian Birchen, and he's, I believe, located in Berlin, and it was just mind-blowing. He'd like added pesto and like groomed the tail. I mean, when the cheese melted, it was a bit weird, but I was super impressed by that. Also, thanks to a few people who uh, helped me 
go through this presentation, and uh, I, I'm not a very funny person naturally, so I like wrote this weeks ago and like labored over it. Um, thank you to uh, Sole Panades, who I've been on vacation with, who had to listen to me go through this over and over again. Special thanks to my friend Danilo Campos, who made that fantastic chart about like how a startup works, and also helped me with some of the other visual elements. Uh, thank you to Jen Schiffer, just because she was polite enough to let me cite her article on California style sheets. Um, and there are a couple of people as well that were proofreaders as well uh, that, that helped this uh, talk actually come together. Um, more seriously though, for just a moment, although it's pretty obvious that everything I've delivered in this talk was meant to be satire, I mean there were some clear obvious points where there was juxtaposition and I was sort of trying to make a truth evident, but most of it was satire. Um, I travel around the world as a part of my job and the sad thing is some of these attitudes are real. Like, I'll be, I'll be at a conference and someone will be like, oh, hey, what do you do for a living? And the person will be like, oh, I'm a designer. And then you hear the other person, who I guess is maybe a pure programmer, go, oh. And I'm like, what the hell is that? I know plenty of designers that code well. And maybe it's because I came from a design background before I was coding, um, you know, at least professionally in the industry, that like I'm particularly sensitive to that. But, but I think that that's some bullshit. And you may not have them in your group in person where you work. But the thing is, if you work on the internet, your peer group is the internet. The internet is and always has been real life. Developers need to be working with other developers, not to minimize the contributions of designers and developers of all kinds and all skill levels and especially those that don't necessarily have the same background as they do. Beyond that, the other issues I touched on about discrimination in the industry, uh, well, white people need to be working with white people to deal with racism, and men need to be working with men to deal with sexism and misogyny. The onus is not on people of color, and the onus is not on women. Remember, when you're faced with a terrible act, even if you did not commit it, if you don't do anything, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. That really sucks. We all need your help in order to make the internet a better place for everyone. So that's it. Thanks, this time for real.